Hello everyone and welcome to today's episode of the Osasu Show. On today's program, we have an exclusive chat with the Executive Governor of Bayelsa State, Honorable Seriaki Dixon. We'll be talking about restructuring and how everyday Nigerians can galvanize the support of the federal government in putting together policies and programs that trickle down to the poorest of the poor in our society. Don't go anywhere, it promises to be a very interesting interview. Welcome back to the Osasu Show. Joining me right now is the Executive Governor of Bayelsa State, Seriki Dixon. Thank you so much for joining us on today's program. Thank you for having me. You're most welcome. Thank You're you. an advocate for restructuring. Can you tell me why and what benefits Bayelsans will derive if we restructure this country? Well, Osasu, thank you for having me and thank you for the wonderful work you and your team have been doing over the years. I've been watching and uh, I must say thank you for uh, what you are doing now. These days, I don't like talking about restructuring um, because there's a feeling by some people that uh, uh, the entire notion of restructuring doesn't make sense. If we're serious about a stable, prosperous Nigeria, then I thought that uh, everybody should be talking of not whether we should restructure, but how do we? Hmm. But the argument from people in the federal government, the argument from some people, is as if there's nothing to restructure, to restructure. about Nigeria. And and I, so I, so mm. these days, my, my dear sister, um, we are passionate about Nigeria. And if people feel that Nigeria is perfect the way it is, I just hope that they are also as patriotic mm. about this Nigeria that we are concerned about as we are. You've talked about some of the subcomponents of restructuring, and a few of them that we'll be talking about today, security, mm -hmm. resource control, mm -hmm. um, education, and, and um, later on we'll be talking about the politics and the upcoming election. But let's touch right now on resource control. In an interview you granted previously, you said oil blocks are the uh, ancestral givings of the Niger Delta. Is this really how you feel? That's not only how I feel, that is the truth. So you believe that since oil is mostly found in the Niger Delta regions, only Niger Delta should benefit from it? No, no. What I'm saying is, look, the oil, what they call oil blocks, you know, Sasu, don't think that oil blocks are some, some uh, crazy things out there. Oil blocks are actually survey plans. They're actually survey plans where people go out there on land or in the shallow waters or at sea and survey a part of someone's land mm. and say that in this area covered by this survey plan there is oil found beneath it and they now locate that parcel of land to someone else so i've been making the point that what people call oil blocks, seated in Lagos, seated in Abuja, seated in the major capitals of the world, talking about oil and gas, hydrocarbon resources in Nigeria, are in fact and in truth the ancestral heritage and properties of the peoples of the Niger Delta. Uh, the point I've been making, which is true, is that uh, yes, uh, no one is saying that oil resources should only be enjoyed by the people of the Niger Delta. No, okay. mm -hmm. that's not what we mean. What we mean is a clarity in the definition of ownership. Clarity. 
And this does not only apply to oil and gas and hydrocarbon resources, but also to other solid minerals, for example. In Zamfara, people are mining gold. Well, they are mining gold. Who are the people mining gold? Who are they paying these monies to for mining gold? Okay? So in the case of Abuja, for example, or Lagos, you get a piece of land, you sell it for billions. Land, the same survey plan. But in Bayelsa, in Delta, in Rivers, in Aquaibo, when you see oil or gas beneath, you change that legal concept, mm. you know? Mm. You throw all known common law, uh, known common law jurisprudence. Yes, and I want it's to know your personal perspective, because right now, but I also derives only 13% 13 per 13 yes. of the entire revenue remit to the federal government. That itself is a fallacy of Sassu. If you own land, you own not only everything above it, you also own everything beneath it. And the Nigerian government, by positive legal legislations, most of which were fashioned, imposed on us by the military, our views were not sought, military decrees. They have taken away that and say, in the case of oil and mineral resources, you don't own the, what is under it. So now, in 13% derivation, the so-called 13% derivation, by the constitution, imposed constitution, first of all, what oil producing states, including Bayelsa, get is very far from 13%. The most powerful entity in Nigeria is not the federal government. The federal government may deceive itself that it's the most powerful. But of recent, there has been a gradual uh, realization of that fallacy. The most powerful entity in Nigeria is the NNPC. The NNPC takes whatever they want to take, gives whatever in-house accounts, and then brings out whatever paltry sum every month to the table as constituting 13%. It is from, from there they will take away subsidy. I have no business with a subsidy. Subsidy is a federal principle. It's a federal policy. But yet, Bayelsa and producing states pay most of the subsidy burden. We bear most of it. And what you call 13%, or what the Nigerian public is deceived about 13%, is actually less than about 5% or 6% of what should really be, be coming to us. So even the notion of a 13% derivation is wrong. Hmm. Excellent. Some people will be watching this interview right now, yes. and they're wondering why we're still talking about oil. The rest of the world is diversifying its energy source. Yes. And in Nigeria, we're so fixated on oil. The majority of our revenue is still coming from oil. Yes. What do we do? How do we respond to critics? Well, you see, that's a valid, very valid assertion, very valid notion. And we shouldn't really be talking about oil or all of our revenue still coming from oil or people's views about the future of Nigeria being determined about whether they will have access to oil revenues or not. So why is it's it surprising. still important that you want ownership of the oil assets in your state? No, you've got to correct the legal principles about ownership. But it's unfortunate, my dear, that we are a nation that is fixated mm, about oil. About oil, oil. Mm -hmm. and, um, but when we wake up one day to discover that oil is no more um, an international, um, is no more in demand because the technology, mm. the technology, now we're dealing with shale oil, for example, shale, which has affected oil projections, crude oil projections, in the last couple of years, which actually contributed to the recession, the last recession, global recession. Mm -hmm. And people are now talking of um, hydrocarbon, you know, nobody's talking of hydrocarbon uh, cars and so on and so forth. People are talking of electric cars, solar powered vehicles and so on and so forth. Mm. So in the next couple of years, naturally, oil will cease to be a dominant factor. Mm. And I don't know, I'm waiting to see. I hope that if it pleases God to keep all of us alive, it will be interesting to see in the next five, ten years where the argument of restructuring will be and those who will be in support of a devolution of powers 
and a review of ownership rights over minerals mm. in this country. Because we have had this centralized situation for over 60 years, you know, mm. where the oil producing people have effectively been expropriated. So but when the oil becomes worthless, because already even now from some reports we have to plead with people, beg Nigeria has to even beg countries to even buy our crude oil. And that brings me to my follow-up yes. question about the IOCs, the role yes. of the IOCs, yes. which is the second prong of this restructuring debate. You've said previously that the <clears throat> power the IOCs willed that in the not so distant future they would create sort of a mafia-like hold on Bielsa State because of the way they relate with criminals. You were referring to the security and surveillance contract that they gave the locals. Yes. Do you believe if Bielsa State was a safe state these IOCs will need to contract security and surveillance to the locals? Generally speaking, Bielsa is one of the safest states in this country. Uh, quite frankly, I've always told them that um, we have a symbiotic relationship. I mean, they need their profits, I need my revenue. Not 13%, <laughs> but what, whatever NNPC, it pleases NNPC <laughs> to calculate at the end of every month to give to us. But you've leveled which, strong accusations against them, that oh, they yeah. would cr they create a mafia-like... Yeah, that's what I'm, I'm coming <laughs> to that. We propose a decent way, a sensible way, a sustainable way of doing it, i.e. the state government setting up a security company, which we're working on. But the oil companies came under a lot of political pressure. Political pressure. And now decided to give surveillance contracts to their own uh, people who have now Abuja connections and so on. Mm. And who are now going about recruiting the wrong set of people. But you're the number one politician in Bielsa. So what other yeah. political pressure do they have to face? Well, the federal government pressure. Hmm. Because the you know oil and gas is in the exclusive list. And see, when we talk about restructuring, these are the elements people don't understand. Oil and gas issues are supposed to be exclusive matters. Meanwhile, their effect is local. But you've got a constitution that says oil, oil and gas disputes and issues are federal. But these thugs and locals that you claim these IOCs are nominating to protect their assets, are they locals or are they from the federal government as well? No, no, no. What I'm saying is these guys are people who pledge allegiance to politicians who have federal connections. The reason they do so, they're clever. The reason they do so is because by our system, oil and gas issues are federal. That's the point I'm making. So if you have party A controlling the federal government, party A appointing the Minister of Petroleum, party A appointing the GMD NMPC, and these are the people who determine these issues, you see people gravitate towards them. And like, as it is in Bielsa, they are the main operatives of the APC. Let me be specific. These criminal elements hiding under the cloak of surveillance contractors are the APC elements. There's no APC in Bielsa outside. So APC in Bielsa is synonymous with surveillance contractors. Do you have let me, let me to put prove it that, that way. Everyone who knows me or has to know that I don't uh, just speak. And I don't speak too often. So that is the situation. Those who know, know. And I won't say more than that. Mm. The reason I bring this topic up because there is no other country I can think of that would allow an international corporation come into its country and give arms to locals to protect its assets. It's unheard of. So as governor of Bielsa State, I obviously would like to know your perspective on this. Yes, you say you have the facts regarding the surveillance contracts and the security, which I want to hear more of because Nigerians also are wondering how this affects their daily lives. Yes, you've been able to quell the security tension in Bielsa over the past seven and a half years, but um, it's, it's inappropriate that this is going on in the 21st century, in 2019. So I want to know what would be some permanent solutions to this? What are sustainable ways that we can ensure that international corporations are not coming into our country and dictating, you know, who lives or not? Because that's exactly what's going on in this situation. As a matter of fact, they even do worse things. 
And as the days and weeks and months go by, Nigerians, if they care, but we, are, we live in a country that sometimes we feel does not care. Um, it's debatable whether Nigerians really care about some of the serious issues that matter. It's debatable more if you have a federal government that cares. Otherwise, a company like Ajib, for example, and they know I have the facts. They know me, they know that I have the facts. And I've told them several times. The surveillance contractors, so-called, that they're employing, who are the APC operatives, are, are carrying out terrorist activities. I have loads and loads of photographs, of films, recordings, where innocent locals have been brutally murdered, some dismembered. Communities overtaken, overrun by these terrorists. And you know what, Osasu? These guys are paid, these contractors are paid the equivalent of what some states get as monthly allocation. Yes. They earn as much as 2 point something billion a month, 3 point something billion naira a month. They pay a terrorist 20 million a month. They offer people in my government, say, go and resign, we'll pay you 10 million a month. So, you see, since 2015, I have been managing a lot of challenges, quietly, not talking much. But, you know, we are contending with a parallel sort of government mm. by the IOCs. You are right, something they can never try in their countries. But there's a commission of inquiry going on. And I want these facts and all collated, then the Nigerian public will know. But like I said, uh, sometimes it's becoming doubtful in this country whether we really care about serious issues, the issues that really matter. Mm. Uh, but we'll see. Yes. So, uh, Your Excellency, as we're rounding up the interview, I want to talk about some of your achievements as you also wrap up your eight years in office. Mm. Uh, as I said earlier, you came into office in February of 2012. Mm. And um, in November, on November 2nd, you'll be having the elections, the gubernatorial elections coming up. Well, that's what INEC has fixed. Mm. We have raised an objection to that date. Okay. Uh, and the public should know that the 2nd of November every year is thank by Elsa Thanksgiving Day, by law. Okay, so you're hoping that they would change it? Well, we have made our representations to okay. them. What? It's, it's in their hands. It's, it's in their hands. So talk to me. I know education is at the core of your you know, gubernatorial mandate, and you've done a lot by making primary and secondary education free in Bielsa State. So talk to me more about this. I believe over 10,000 students uh, were sent to school under a free scholarship in Bielsa. So what other achievements were you able to consolidate during this past? Well, first of all, I was very clear when I was running for governorship. I was very clear about the, the state of development or underdevelopment of my, of my state and what needed to be done. What needed to be done. Very clear roadmap that I have. And if you look at my inaugural address, look at my declaration uh, speech, uh, where I pointed most of these uh, things out. Almost everything that I've done in the last seven years um, kind of fits into that uh, dream and plan. And education occupied a very central position because I believe that for an oppressed people, for an underdeveloped people, the greatest tool you can use, the greatest instrument, most effective instrument um, to utilize in fighting underdevelopment and empowering a poor, oppressed people. Uh, because my people are one of the most oppressed people on the face of the earth. Yes. And sometimes Nigerians don't know. How is they, that? They, they take, for example, your terminals are all in Niger territories where you take crude oil and export to Nigeria as you have been doing for over 60 years. And not one of them has a road to it. The terminal in Brass, you can't get there. The terminal in Ogola, in Delta State, the Jok community, you can't get there. The terminal in um, Boni, you can't get there by road. The terminal in Fokadus, you can't get there by road. What I thought should be uppermost in the minds of any leader should be education. So education first, education second, education third. Hmm. 
And I'm guessing that's a legacy and you want to leave behind. Yes, but much more than a legacy, I would like to see governments after governments in Bielsa continuing on the path of sustained investments in education. In spite of a recession, we have spent now close to 100 billion naira. Not salaries, but educational infrastructure. I'm talking of primary schools, I'm talking of secondary schools. There was no single boarding school in Bielsa before I became governor. And now you have almost 15 and still counting. Some of the children, the first time they came to those schools was the very first time they left their homes. And a number of them, when I got the initial reports, I almost shed tears, but I know that was true. They refused to go home on holidays because it was in the schools that they started eating three meals a day. Is this part of the federal government school fee? No, federal government is not doing secondary boarding. Federal government have not received one dime from the federal government. For the school feeding For program. the school feeding program. Federal government school feeding program has not come to Bielsa. So we have established mm -hmm. the Bielsa Medical University, the International Institute of Tourism Development, mm. the State Polytechnic, even a driving school. So it's schools, 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 and yet more schools. Awesome, awesome. When I started the University of Africa and they complained, I told them your punishment for complaining is more schools. <laughs> and for the women and uh, the children, we have the most robust program for reducing maternal and infant mortality. Mm. In Bayelsa, when a woman gets pregnant, she's entitled to 3,000 naira every month. Our condition is that you must register in a health center, in any medical facility, you must go for your antenatal, and you must deliver there in a, in a recognized government facility. And you still get paid 3,000 for two more months after delivery. So, for those who want to have safe babies and have their and still be alive, come to Bielsa. Come to Bielsa. <laughs> come to Bielsa. So, Bielsa is on top mm -hmm. of most states. You're but we do it quietly. I, I must commend you, though. Yes. Been, the Osasu Show has been to Bielsa before, and we've seen some of this impact trickle down to the poorest of the poor in Bielsa State. We will be coming back again yes. to um, follow up, because we were there about two years ago. We'll be coming back again to follow up to ensure that all these policies and programs are impacting positively in the lives of yeah. Bielsa. Uh, welcome you. Thank you. I'll invite you formally to Bielsa. Thank you, Excellency. Finally, I just need a name. Um, who would you hope? to succeed you as governor in Bayelsa in 2020? Tell me a name. A name? <laughs> I understand there are so many names out there. And let me say that from all the names that I've heard and read about on the social media and the conventional press, um, by the way, Bayelsa is a state of great and wonderful people. Uh, and uh, I believe that they're all wonderful Bayelsans. Who are you supporting? Um, as governor now leading this wonderful team that I have, I should be. And I know the responsibilities that come with that. Mm. I know the responsibilities that come with that. Mm. So I cannot lightly reject or endorse any individual. I wish them all well. I hope they are all good party men. I hope that they are also prayerful. I hope that they are also consulting, as I've told all of them to do so. And then at the end of the process, the delegates of the, to the primaries, duly and properly assembled, will decide. Political the leaders, answer, but the leaders of the party, <laughs> which I'm one, will make an will make Your Excellency, thank you so much. Thank for you, Osasu, time. for having me. You're most and welcome. Thank you for the great work you've been doing. Thank you so much. And I look forward to seeing you in Bielsa. I definitely will come with my right. team. Thank, thank you. Very you. Much. That's it for today's program. To find out more about the Osasu Show and our other programs on TOS TV Network, you can visit our website www.tostvnetwork.com. You can also find on there news on sustainable development and current affairs across Africa. Don't forget to follow us on social media at the Osasu Show, at TOS TV Network, at Osasu Ignatian, and at the Osasu Show Foundation on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. I'll see you same time, same place next week, and until then, take very good care of yourself. God bless you.